Uh, Domenico D'Argenio here with us now is going to talk to us about uh, back to basics. There's no agile without psychological safety. Before I do, though, the thing we've just been referring to is the fact that if you ever take uh, uh, Domenico out for a meal and buy him pizza, do not put pineapple on it. He says there's no place on a pizza for pineapple. Although Absolutely not. Like Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Dominican. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And um, before, before getting started, I would like to invite all of you to write down questions, comments, etc. There will be some time at the end of the, the presentation for us to go through, to discuss, etc. And uh, I would like to share my screen. And here we go. Can you all see my screen now? So. Yeah, it's, 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 but this is, you know, this is actually easier in many ways. Cause... So, you know, this is about data now, right? I, I just wanted well, we to make do. a point. Yeah, well, we do work now. This is, this is what, you know, I just wanted to make a point about my fight here in Finland against pineapple pizza. And you can imagine that as an Italian living in, in Helsinki for the last 12 years, this is a very tough uphill battle, as a matter of fact, when you consider that pineapple pizza is the most ordered online pizza all over Finland. But anyway, one conversation at a time, we are gonna make a change, slowly but surely. Uh, but jokes aside, um, I think that uh, Rob was mentioning already that um, when we talk about Agile, we cannot really do it without thinking about the role that people play in Agile. And so I would like to go back really to the basics today. I would like to go back to the roots of Agile and the very first principle of the Agile Manifesto individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And I think that some presenter before me today has been already talking about this when he was talking about the importance of one-on-one -on -one interactions, right? So what we know about Agile is that at the very, very core of it, there is one key element. And that key element is the Agile team no matter which practices, frameworks, tools, processes we put in place, at the very core of it, there is an agile team. An agile team that is supposed to be working together in a cross-functional way and is able to deliver continuous incremental value to the customer. Now, if we put a team together and it's a cross-functional team, people with different skill sets and capabilities and needs, what do we expect to happen? We might have actually ticked the box for diversity even, right? However, performance doesn't happen in the, in, in the vacuum. Performance doesn't happen automatically just because we put together a cross-functional team. And so, the big question that we have been trying to answer for decades, way before Agile came to the scene, has been how do we create successful teams? What are really the key ingredients of successful, successful teams? So I will focus a little bit on this topic. And after talking about that and understanding why is it important to address this topic, I would like to share also some relatively concrete tips about what can each of us start doing already tomorrow to make our teams more successful. And this is regardless if we are in a leadership position or not, because we are all accountable to actually foster psychological safety in our teams. So the presentation will be split into three areas. We will talk about successful teams and what are the ingredients. We will talk about the connection between 
psychological safety and high performance, and we will talk about concrete tips. And this is very much what I do uh, for living uh, today. I have about 20 years of experience in the industry. I've had very different roles um, in a large Finnish company with uh, international, let's say, presence. But at the moment, I work as a consultant and coach, helping businesses achieve high performance in a human-centric way. What does it mean? Well, let's start from understanding what are the key elements of successful teams. So one of the studies, the research that uh, has made really a big progress for us understanding successful teams is the Aristotle project from Google. Around 2012, Google embarked on this research project. And of course, having Google deep pockets, they put on a lot of effort into really understanding this, right? Trying to answer this question. So they assembled this team of researchers. And first of all, they started defining, okay, how do we define success? And so success was defined through a number of criteria, which were more, both uh, qualitative and quantitative. So you could think about business metrics, right? KPIs, customer satisfaction, sales quota, etc. Uh, you can think about qualitative metrics, for instance, internal feedback with, within the team, but also stakeholder feedback. Right. Dominique, sorry to interrupt you. Um, we're just not seeing, I don't think we're seeing the slides you intended us to see. Are you not? Okay, because it, it tells me that it's sharing. Ah, yeah. Um, it, yeah, we're, we're not, they're not moving on. Give me, give me one second. I'll share the entire screen and let's see if it is better. Can you see it now? Yeah, we're seeing your presentation but not in a presentation format we're seeing the bottom there. okay there what go. about now all, all right. right thank you good. good okay um so what makes the team successful right so we were talking about this research project from google um so what they did was okay having defined success then they started a few hundred teams and they started mapping the success of these teams and then they started considering a couple of hundred different, different variables to, to really try to estimate which kind of variable are influencing the success of the teams. And so you can imagine in this case thinking about, okay, the seniority of the team, the skills of the team, the diversity, and so on and so forth, right? The fact that they were co-located or distributed, etc., etc. A couple of hundred variables is plenty of variables, right? And so they found that by running through about 35 different statistical models, there were four elements that were standing out as very strong influencers to the success of a team. It was about dependability. Dependability means that if I say I will do something by tomorrow, I will keep my word so the team can rely on me. It's about clarity, clarity about roles, expectations, responsibilities, not meaning that their job roles might be very defined, right? But at least being clear about what is expected from me. It's about meaning. Individuals who were working in team with a strong sense of purpose for their work were leading to success. And last but not least, it was about impact. Do I feel by working in this team that actually my contribution is relevant and significant to the impact the whole team is making? However, even when these four elements were showing up strongly in teams, there was one element that was much stronger than all of these, whose presence was actually strengthening or, or, or weakening these four other elements. And that element was psychological safety. Surprise, surprise. And it's interesting because the, the, the team of researchers at Google, they came across this psychological safety concept halfway through their research project. 
they came across in the in the you know in the research literature on this topic from uh, Amy Edmondson, professor at Harvard, and they realized that okay, uh, maybe this could be interesting to throw into the mix of the variables to check, and to discover that this was the number one element that was basically influencing the success or lack of success of a team. So together, these were then the five elements that became the kind of criteria um, that teams were supposed to work on in order to progress in their, in their performance. How do we define psychological safety? Well, let's, let's um, say, let's see what uh, Professor Amy says about it, right? In very simple terms, psychological safety is a belief that if I speak up and share my ideas, my questions, my concerns, my mistakes while working within a team or any other context, I will not be punished or humiliated, regardless of the content of my ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes, right? So it's pretty simple at the end of the day. What is not simple is to create work environment that are psychologically safe. The most interesting thing of psychological safety is really the impact that can have on teams and more broadly speaking, on organizations. And three of the biggest impacts can be seen on innovation, on engagement, and on learning. So research shows that teams and companies that have high level of psychological safety are significantly more successful across these three dimensions, which I think when, when we consider it, is quite obvious in hindsight, right? Think about engagement. If you belong to a team where you can, basically what we are saying here is that you can be yourself, you can come to the table and ask your questions and share your concerns and not worry too much if you have made a mistake and talk about it and we can learn from that. And the, the very process of learning is based on actually making mistakes and asking for support. And the very process of innovation, you all know and remember the quote from Edison, right? I didn't fail 1,000 times to invent the light bulb. I just found 1,000 different ways to make it work. So these three elements are crucial when we talk about the impact of psychological safety. And if you think about the environment, the context in which we are operating nowadays with this very high level of uncertainty and complexity, companies need more and more of these elements to be successful in the, in the marketplace. So, Okay, the, the, we have seen this kind of general statement and definition of psychological safety. However, if we want to, to kind of work actively to develop a team, a place which is, more, which is more psychologically safe, how do we go about it? Well, we need to rely on the definition of psychological safety into four different dimensions. So there are four dimensions that all together will form psychological safety for a team. And these four dimensions are, first of all, inclusion and diversity, meaning that can I be myself? Do we accept and respect everyone for who they are? Then we have willingness to help. And willingness to help is about the spirit of helping each other within the team. If I need support, can I ask it freely? And can I expect my other team members to help me? Or will I be seen as weak? Attitude to risk and failure, the second last, is about how do we relate in the team to possible mistakes, to making uh, decisions where risk is involved. And if I make a mistake, how is that considered? Do we learn from it collectively or do we point fingers? 
And last but not least, open conversation. Open conversation is also something very similar to what we could call radical candor. And what we mean here is, do we have the capability within the team to bring difficult topics to the table? And do we have the capability to discuss openly about these things? Or do we just beat around the bushes and try to protect ourselves and just have the surface conversation, leaving the rest you know, below the surface, a little bit like the iceberg tip, right? Um, so you know, one example I, I want to share from one of my past experiences, an example of open conversation is what happens when you're having, for instance, a team meeting online. And, uh, and you know, there is some challenge that, uh, that people are not very openly discussing. What happens then? Do people bring the topic to the, for the entire team? Or do you see that people start chatting behind the scenes in WhatsApp and in Teams, etc.? you know, kind of saying, yeah, but what, what we are discussing now is so wrong. I don't agree with that. So, you know, when this sidetrack conversation happens, this is a very strong sign of not having an open conversation uh, approach within the team. So these are the four dimensions, right? And so if we want to be uh, creating an environment with high level of psychological safety, we need to be thinking about all these four dimensions and what can we do to, in order to foster each of them to a higher level. What is one of the things that is a sign very often of lack of psychological safety? It's silence. And why is silence a sign of low psychological safety? Because silence is human. And uh, every one of us shares, regardless of where we come from, regardless of our experience, regardless where we are in the social ranking or in the company ranking, if I call it in that way, right? In the hierarchy, whether we are the CEO or whether we are the salesperson, the purchase person, the engineer, the software developer, it doesn't really matter. For the simple fact that we are human, we share some basic human needs. And these basic human needs are the needs of uh, belonging, the needs of uh, affirming ourselves through what we do, the need of being liked. These are basic, basic human needs that we all share. They might be a little bit stronger, a little, a little bit, um, you know, less in 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 some of us but we all share these basic needs for the simple fact that we are human. And so why is silence so powerful? Because imagine when we have these needs, silence is there to help us fulfill these needs. Because in a situation when I'm not sure whether my question will be accepted or not, I simply decide to be quiet and to stay silent because it's safe, it's fulfilling my need, my need to belong and to be liked. If I don't want to look like incompetent and I'm afraid that people in the team, in a discussion might consider me incompetent, what do I do? Do I share an half developed idea that might, might get some pushback or, or do I decide to be quiet and silent? Silence. And so silence is a very, very good investment if you think in terms of risk reward. If I decide for silence today, there is an immediate return, which is I don't risk anything for myself. I will not look incompetent. I will not look like I'm disturbing. I, I will not look like I'm challenging. Immediate, immediate reward. And it's for myself. If I choose the way of voicing my question, concerns, challenges, what happens? What happens is that 
there might or might not be a reward, a benefit. And that benefit, by the way, is going to happen. If it happens, it happens after some time. And it's not only for me, it's for a broader cause. So every time we are in these situations, especially in the beginning when we start interacting within a new team, in a new context, in a new environment, in our brain, there is this risk-reward calculation going on all the time. We are considering and calculating this interpersonal risk and, and really you know, automatically doing an evaluation. Does it make sense for me to speak up or is it better that I stay quiet? And unfortunately, science is very powerful. So one might say that our default option is silence. Of course, then we grow and we develop and we can practice and improve. But our very human nature with these human needs and with our need to protect and safeguard ourselves would automatically drive us towards silence. So I guess the question that, that you know, we ask ourselves is, okay, this seems, you know, it's a difficult th thing to achieve psychological safety. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of emotional toll, as a matter of fact, right? So then we start thinking, is it really worth it? What if we just play it safe? We all play safe, etc. Well, the difference between having or not psychological safety is exactly the same difference as playing to win or playing not to lose, right? When you have high level of psychological safety, then you're really playing to win. And if you instead play the safe game, then it's just playing not to lose, right? And given the context in which we are, we are operating at the moment, as I said already a few minutes ago, the thing is that when we operate in a high level of complexity on both the context side and the business side, meaning that, you know, the context is... Of course, as you can imagine, we have had Corona, we have had the war, we have stagflation, meaning high level of inflation, but also no significant level of growth in the market and uh, supply chain disruption, etc. Very complex. We don't know what will happen, right? Our businesses are also very complex because we produce products and services and solutions and we are organized in very complex way. So, you know, most of us, are operating somewhat in the top right corner. Meaning that if we want to be successful in the top right corner, we really need everyone to bring their A game to the table. It's not enough to say, let's play it safe so that we avoid to lose because there is no winning or losing here. Either you win or you're out of the game, right? So together with silence, fear, is, a, is another very, very powerful element. And so I guess if I reverse the question, is it worth doing it? Let's reverse the question. What if we don't do it? Do we know some cases? Well, we know plenty of cases, unfortunately. And, and unfortunately, we have many more cases of companies that lacks or lacked psychological safety and very few that are really setting the record straight for having a high level of psychological safety. So I have some examples here. I would like to walk you through quickly those examples. And we just happen to be in Finland at the moment, so you also see Nokia on this slide, right? But if I take them in order. Okay, a few years ago, you might remember that there have been two Boeings, 737 MAX, who basically crashed, killing a number of people. Um, one of the reasons why the two Boeings crashed was the fact that the company started a program for decreasing cost and increasing efficiency. And uh, even though people in the company, in the engineering team, in the manufacturing team, saw challenges with this, they couldn't bring this up to the senior executives. And in fact, there were a number of people who got fired for complaining about these challenges. Um, about some of these cases, by the way, I will say now, but it's valid for most of them. On Netflix, there are some beautiful documentaries about Wells Fargo, about Volkswagen, about Boeing as well. I think, I think the series called Dirty Money. So 
case Boeing. A few hundred people died because of lack of psychological safety and this kind of culture of fear, right? Volkswagen, I think you are all familiar again a few years ago with the diesel gate. Um, the point here is not whether Volkswagen is the only one to do it or not. Probably other companies have been doing it. But anyway, Volkswagen is a company that came really to the big screen because of this issue, right? Again, a culture of fear where you set unrealistic targets and you say, it doesn't matter, you just do it. And if you cannot do it, I'll get other people to do it. There we are. How many billions did Volkswagen pay in fines? 10 billions or something? By the way, these are risks that um, might actually collapse your company, eh? no matter how big it is. Then we have Wells Fargo, bottom left. Wells Fargo is a very, uh, very well-established American bank. What happened with Wells, Wells Fargo was that uh, they went on an ambition plan, um, wanted to achieve a result which has not been seen on the market. So they were talking about the motto that was eight is great. And what they meant with that is that they wanted to see for each of their client that each of their clients would have a port at least a portfolio of eight different products. What does it mean? What it means that if I am a client of Wells Fargo, I might have a bank account, a credit card, a debit card, um, an investment, right? And so on, and insurance, and so on and so forth. So eight of them. And they were very, very aggressive to achieve this. By the way, the average in the market was 2.6. So you can put in perspective how much eight means, right? So, so what happens is that they go very, very aggressively on with this plan. And they would have four calls per day with their salespeople. Early morning, mid-morning, early afternoon, late afternoon. Bombarding them. Have you achieved your quota for the past two hours? Have you achieved your quota for the half day? Have you achieved your quota for the two, uh, three-fourths of the day? Etc. So, of course, when you have that kind of pressure, and there is no way to discuss that, hey, this is simply unrealistic. Because if you say that, you're out of the company. What happened is that employees started doing not so good things. So if I work in the bank, I will start opening the bank account for me, to my wife, my dog, my daughter who is seven years old, my mom, my uncle, my entire Italian family, which is pretty big, because that's the only way I could reach that number including opening some of these things, some of these products, credit cards and lines of credits, etc., without actually informing the people. So people were having credit cards in their name without even knowing it. You can imagine which big scandal this became in the States, right? Then we have Nokia. And I guess, well, okay, I think Nokia has been so much in the, you know, in the public, in Finland, etc. But clearly in Nokia, the culture of fear where despite the middle management was seeing the threat of the iPhone and this new market opening up with the smartphones, etc. Et you know, they, there was no way to bring this message up to the, to the, to the people, let's say, in the executive uh, teams. And then there is NASA, where there has been a couple of different accidents. There was so much pressure to make these missions happen that they took risks that they could have avoided by simply postponing, for instance, the launch or the comeback after, for, for a few days. So we're literally talking about a few days. And what, what was the cost of that? It was tens of lives of the astronauts who died either in the launch or in the coming back. Yet, the most powerful example, in my opinion, of all of this is, you know, not only the fact that, uh, okay, the life of a few astronauts, the life of people on the plane, you know, it's like, at least their own life is not on the line. Well, that's not the case because we have one awful example, late eighties in Tenerife airport. This is the biggest um, civil aviation accident in the entire history. Two planes crashed onto each other on the runway. One plane was waiting to take off and the other plane was taking off and they crashed onto each other. 
And it all happened because in one of the two cockpits, there were, there were the captain and there was the co-pilot. And the captain was somewhat in a hurry to get off that airport. And the co-pilot said, one time, I don't think we got green light to take off. The captain, being very strong-minded, answered very aggressively. And that was enough for the co-pilot not to challenge him anymore, even if his own life was on the line. And that's, for me, the strongest sign of how powerful fear and silence are. When even your own life is on the line, you might decide in that moment not to take that interpersonal risk. Luckily, luckily, we don't experience this kind of situation and challenges at this level of risk every day in our life, luckily. But I want you to remember how powerful silence and fear can be. People, if people decide to not use their voice at this level, they will do it for much, much less as well. All right, let's try to get out of this uh, depression pit I brought you now, uh, talking about the power of fear and what happens when we don't have high level of, of psychological safety. And I want to talk about something very important, which again, I picked during one of the speeches today. Someone was talking about accountability, right? So there are some myths associated with psychological safety, and I would like to debunk some of them. And those myths are very dangerous. So one of the things that I hear from time to time when I talk to teams and leaders and I try to help them develop to high performance teams is, oh, but that's easy then. Of course, we have already high level of psychological safety. We are all so nice with each other. Yes, it's very good that you're nice with each other. That's called education, by the way. Um, but having a high level of psychological safety, for having a high level of psychological safety, it's not enough to just be nice. And especially not to be nice simply on the surface. What I said before, remember the tip of the iceberg. On the surface, we are all nice with each other. Good job, nice presentation. And meanwhile, in WhatsApp, we are texting, we are texting our colleague like, what was that piece of crap, right? So it's not about being nice. And it's not about deciding by consensus. And by the way, I don't think that no one ever said that working in an agile approach means deciding by consensus, right? Everyone contributes, everyone shares their thoughts. I think there are clear processes for who makes which calls, which I think is important. The third one is about conflicts. Oh, that's gonna be so nice if we have that level high level of psychological safety. Finally, we don't have conflicts. I beg to differ with this. Having high level of psychological safety, as a matter of fact, brings more conflicts. However, we need to talk about which kind of conflicts we will have. And so the traditional conflict is you and me are fighting about something, and it's me fighting against you. The conflicts that we want to see and we will see when we get in high level of psych safety is where you and me are fighting together against, against one topic, against one challenge, and that's very different. So what we say in these cases is that psychological safety will increase the level of intellectual friction while decreasing the level of interpersonal friction. And last but not least, you know, there is this understanding of, oh, that's good. That means that there, there is not going to be pressure. And even if we don't meet our goals, it's all good. Even if our velocity as a team goes a little bit down, it's good because with high level of safety, you know, we can relax and it's going to be okay. 
Um, let's stop it there. It's absolutely not about this. Psychological safety goes and needs to go hand in hand with performance standards. It needs to go hand in hand with accountability. We are not here to create high level of psychological safety for the sake of it and become friends. We are here to create psychological safety because then everyone will feel better and we will perform as a team. And that's what we see on this chart where we map, in fact, psychological safety on the Y axis and performance standards accountability on the X axis. So let's check a little bit where we are here, right? What happens when we are on the bottom left, top right, etc. Let's start from bottom left. If we have low level of psych safety, it means that we are really afraid and worried. And so we try to not engage, right? Because it's safe. It's safe to not engage. It's safe to keep our head down and say, okay, let me be on the lookout for risks and, you know, dangers. This is the safest place. If at the same time, there is no much accountability and performance standards, means that it means that, you know, not much is expected of us. So, you know, this is the typical situation where everyone does their own without trying to interfere too much. You know, the days go by, the weeks go by, nothing happens. Whether we meet or not our goals, it's okay. As long as I stay safe in my corner. Not a good place to be. However, not the worst place to be. Because worse than that, there is the anxiety zone. And the anxiety zone is when we still have that low level of safety. So, you know, it's very dangerous to kind of take your head out and ask questions, make comment, concerns, make a mistake because you're really afraid of the consequences. But that is combined in this case with a high level of performance standard and accountability. So I'm giving you very stretching goals and very stretching targets, very complex projects. And if you fail, then we're going to talk about it. Then you will see the consequences. Um, really, really not a nice place to be. So in the apathy zone, we might get bored and we are a little bit worried. In the anxiety zone, we, we go to burnout without any exception. So what happens then when we start becoming good at raising the level of psychological safety? Well, the top left is the comfort zone. Comfort zone is when we have high level of psychological safety. So you see these teams with amazing level of dialogue and discussions and collaboration and inclusion, etc. However, the performance standards and the accountability are hold still on a relatively low level. So, you know, that's the classic thing where everything goes well, but still the performance could be so much better, right? And in order to get there, well, then we need to maybe rotate a little bit the performance standards to a higher level. Because when we put the performance standards towards more stretching goals and accountability, etc. Then we end up in the learning zone. And le the learning zone is when we try things, we are really working on the borderline of our capabilities, right? When we are really growing and learning and performing. And that's where really the magic happens. And so in my own experience, um, in my own experience, we have all have tried and have experienced certain level of all of these things, right? And a team can also move dynamically. I mean, both individual, individual team members and teams can move dynamically between this zone, depending on the period, depending on the context, the situation, etc. But of course, what we should all aim to do is to move always as much as possible towards the right zone. And it's interesting because in my... In my work as a, as a psychological safety practitioner, um, I have had the, most of my cases have been cases where the team is in the comfort zone, where the leader has come to me 
with this with 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 that problem that sounds like uh, hey i'm really happy where we are with the team also the team is very happy we can see that from all the you know engagement surveys and discussions we have etc however i think that we are a little bit too relaxed i think that we could perform so much better i think that we are still too careful and tiptoeing and and you know the people don't dare to challenge and push each other etc right and so the question is how do we really become a high performance team and then you know to to be honest that's that's a wonderful challenge to have right because it's very difficult if you are working with teams that are in the apathy zone on the on the anxiety zone with teams that are, that have low level of psychological safety and one of the reasons why we don't work too much with these kind of teams is that guess what their leader is completely oblivious to the fact that they they lack psychological safety right those are not the leaders who have high level of self awareness to understand that they are actually creating a very unsafe environment the leader who are aware about this are the leader that have already fostered a relatively high level of safety and they are more aware about these topics and now they want to move more to, towards the top right and i would like you to a little bit reflect at this point and think where are you in your current team if you think about the team we do you spend most of the time in your work interaction at the moment right where do you think you are in terms of this four zone comfort zone learning zone anxiety zone apathy zone i would love to see some statistics so if you if you feel safe enough to share with us on the chat in which zone you think you are yourself how you feel yourself in this team i would love to see some numbers later some you know some answers and also to remember that when we talk about this we are talking about individual perception you and me might be working in exactly the same team and our perception may be completely different because we all have very individual subjective perspective of what is the performance standards that puts us under stress or not right and our own individual perception of psychological safety and what i want to add here is that even though the leader of the team has an oversized responsibility to force up psychological safety he is not the only person accountable for that within a team we are all accountable of creating psychological safety i might feel very safe in my interaction with the team leader however at the same time i might feel very unsafe interacting with a colleague Hmm? so keep this in mind we are not putting all the responsibility on the shoulder of the team leader we all have responsibility to foster psychological safety within the team all right so how do we start well before going into some practical examples Uh, on what each of us can do i would like to talk about the fact that you cannot run before you walk and the same happens with psychological safety so before we talked about the four dimensions that constitute together psychological safety and those were inclusion and diversity willingness to help attitude to risk and failure and last but not least we had open discussion right now what i want to talk about are the four stages of psychological safety meaning that when we start as a new team we go through usually different stages of psychological safety and again we are talking about something which moves dynamically it's not like something you know that becomes static and once we achieve certain level a certain stage then we are there forever as soon as for instance a team member moves out of the team or a team member comes into the team or something happens in the team a project fails or a pro- project succeeds etc 
we move as a team dynamically through this. So it's important to be aware, where are we and how do we get back eventually to the, to the higher level, so to say. So the four stages are, first of all, inclusion safety, meaning that the very, very basic level of psychological safety is when everyone feels included. I feel I am now part of this team. I belong here. And this inclusion, of course, it should be granted for the simple fact that I am a human being. Nothing else should matter. If I'm joining a new team as a newcomer myself, nothing else should matter to grant me to feel part of this team more than the fact that simply the simple fact that I am a person, a human being, right? Easy to say, unfortunately, this is not happens very often. But once I feel part of this team, what's next? Well, the next is I feel I can learn. And learning very often happens by asking questions and making mistakes, right? Now I feel safe enough that I can ask questions and not worry too much about making mistakes. Uh, there is a mismatch here. I want to go first to the top right. The third one is contributor. Now I feel that I can contribute to this team. Okay? I feel that my contribution is taken into consideration and is contributing to the impact of the team. Right? And last but not least, once I, you know, once I fulfill these previous, these first three levels of safety, then there is the last one. And the last one is what we call the challenger safety. And the challenger safety is that I feel safe enough to actually raise my hand and say, sorry, guys, I do not agree. I think there is a better way. I think we should go back to the drawing table because of this and that. As a newcomer to a team, it's very hard for me to feel very safe and, and, you know, to feel the safety to be a challenger right away. Right away. It is very difficult. It is very difficult. It requires, you know, the only way to, to, for that to happen is that there is a proper due diligence at the beginning of a new journey within a team, for instance, to say, hey, this is how we work. These are our practices. We would like you to really challenge us from day one. And even in that case, I will always have in the back of my mind the question, how much can I really challenge on day one? How will they consider me? They will think that I just came here as the person who knows more and is trying to destroy the plans, etc. So these are the four, the four stages. And now we go to something more practical. What do we do? What do we do as a leader, if we are leading a team, but also if we are a team member? Because each of us can bring this to their own teams, whether in a leadership position or not. First of all, the leader, as I said before, is an oversized responsibility to create safe environment. This means that we need to be clear about expectations. We need to frame the work and we need to explain that we understand we are all going to make mistakes and it's okay. And it's more important to make mistakes and learn from them than hide them because then we keep making them. And guess what? What's the best way for you to invite people to, to do that? Is for you yourself, show your own vulnerability and share your mistake. Do that. Right? You are human. And as a human person, you make mistakes. It's part of our nature. And you are vulnerable. Whether you want to show it or not, it's a different thing, but you are vulnerable. So vulnerability becomes really a basic element here in order to create trust and psychological safety. 
then we talk about the go together, right? And the go together is once I create the context and I talk about, I frame the work in a certain way and I show my vulnerability and for instance, I share mistakes, etc. It's time to invite the others. The best way to invite the others is not only role modeling, but also to, to anchor these things into the practice of the work we do. So one very practical way to do this is if you think about working in two-week sprints, right? At the beginning of each sprint, you could actually decide on one behavior you are going to practice and stress very much during this sprint. For instance, that might be asking for support, right? So what do we do? We agree we're going to practice this behavior we are going to overdo this behavior in order to really strengthen our muscles for this behavior. And after the two weeks, when we do our sprint retrospective, we're going to discuss about this. How did we do? How can we improve? And how do we take this forward? Next sprint, you talk about the next behavior. So imagine that psychological safety is having four dimensions. If you practice in each sprint one behavior per dimension, sorry, in each sprint one behavior only, and so each sprint only one dimension, after four sprints, so after two months, you have already practiced four different behaviors for the four different dimensions. That's already a big, big step compared to doing nothing and, and compared to hoping that just with our natural interactions, things are going to be good. We need to be deliberate. We need to be actively developing psychological safety. It doesn't happen by magic. And so only by implementing and anchoring these new behaviors into our practices, for instance, the sprint the planning and retrospective, etc., we can consistently and consciously improve. Well, if I, if I very, very quickly summarize what we discussed, and more than happy then to have some, some questions, we talked about teamwork and team performance and the, you know, their importance to business success. And the fact that, again, at the very core of Agile, there is an Agile team. And an Agile team can put into practice all the tools and frameworks that you want, tens of them. But only if they have a high level of psycho psychological safety, they will be successful. And that's really the kind of cultural transformation that we talk about when we talk about the mindset behind Agile. How do you expect the team members, the individual team members in an Agile team to actually make decisions if they are all the time afraid of making mistakes and taking accountability. That will not happen. Especially when these teams are being born in companies that have never worked that way. Companies where you need to go up seven layers in order to have a decision about, can I spend 50 euros to buy uh, you know, a mouse, right? And so in this case, the, the metaphor that we, use, that we use usually is that psychological safety is the soil. You need to have that soil. And only when you have this good soil, you can plant things that will grow, right? If you put, if you put your seeds on stone, nothing will grow. You need to take care of the soil in order to see performance uh, flourish. However, like every good thing in life, nothing comes without a good amount of hard work. So even the soil per se doesn't make magic. You need to contribute, you need to work actively, you need to take care of it, and that's the only way to get the benefits out of it. And the benefits are high-performing teams. High-performing teams that have not only a very big business impact, but also people who are engaged, people who feel good. 
And that's for me the most important thing about Agile. I'm not loving Agile for the sake of Agile. I'm loving Agile because I see it as a very strong way to make companies more human-centric. And if there is just one thing that I want you to take away with you from today, is that do not have pineapple on pizza. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dominico, for what a fantastic and inspiring um, a humanistic talk there to to end on our, uh, our virtual track today. So thank you ever so much there. Any questions for Dominico, please um, put them into chat there. Um, I've got one here straight away. Here we go, off to the uh, off to the races. Tarot, in building psychological safety as a team lead, what kind of topics would you include or would you discuss one-to-one -one with individual team members, if any, as opposed to all? So is there kind of, I guess it's a one-to-one -one and at one to all kind of a, uh, levels of approaches that we've got with psychological safety? Um, I love this question. Mm. And uh, and by the way, I see that Tero is also the person who put there, was in apathy zone, working to keep myself out of anxiety, then changing. So there is a lot of stuff there. Uh, I'll go through the answers later. Um, so I don't think there is one precise answer to that question, Tero. The answer that I have to that question is that uh, guess, guess what creates a higher level of psychological safety between people? It's very simple. It's getting to know each other. So, you know, why do we have all these uh, team building events, going to sauna together, getting a beer, etc.? Proximity and interaction is what builds deeper connection and relationship. And when we have deeper relationship and, and, and connection with people, we, we see higher level of psychological safety. So it doesn't really matter which one topic you discuss one-on-one. -on -one. What is important is that you find your way to connect one-on-one -on -one with the other person, whatever the topic is. With someone will be football. With someone else would be pineapple pizza, with someone else would be ice hockey, with someone else would be whiskey. It doesn't matter. Whatever builds a strong interpersonal relationship, because that's where you create the psych safety. That's where each one of us, if we build that interpersonal connection, each one of us is ready to lower our risk radar, to say, okay, I have low risk of interaction with this person, I can be born myself. I can admit a mistake. I can ask for support. Thank you. Awesome answer. Um, another question we got here. Another kind of relative. These are kind of relevant to a lot of people's working experiences. Team size. Uh, is there is there an equation of any sort of team size and psychological safety? I mean, we often talk. You know, the the ideal uh, agile team size is. Uh, you know, no more than nine with your, your, your uh, yeah, the two the two pizzas, etc. Right. Um, this is a, a wonderful question. Um, I haven't seen any research talking about this. However, I would like to add two elements here. So the first element is a deduction, right? So if we say that this individual connection in the personal relationship are important for psych safety, I think we can soon deduct that uh, when teams are growing in size, it becomes more difficult, right? Because it's more difficult to have these one-on-one -on -one interactions. Mm. First point. The second point, I want to share an, uh, an, an example from a company, very, very successful company. Um, there is this very successful company, which is called uh, Gore. You all know the Gore text material, right? Well, if you live in Finland, you know, because you cannot live without it, right? So the Gore-Tex material is produced by a chemical light technology company, which is called Gore. Gore has a very strange principle in the way they operate their business their, their, and their companies. And I might say they are so successful that there must be some truth in it, right? The way they operate is this. They have many, many different sites where they do research, production, sales, etc. And the rule of thumb is, as soon as one site is reaching the tipping point of 250 people, 
they will open the next one. And why is that? They did their research, they did their own work. And the explanation for that is that in anthropology, researchers have discovered that the amount of people for a tribe to remain one tribe and have enough meaningful interaction with each other and knowing each other enough, well enough, etc., is about 250. And when you go above that number, what happens is that you start having sub-tribes as small groups, and you know, and the tribes start to be in competition with each other, etc. And so apparently, Gore, you know, leaning on this research, they decided to practice this. Well, I mean, to be honest, they are one of the most successful company in their own, in their own, of course, business, right? When it comes to IP and innovation and product and growth, etc. So I think this is really fascinating. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, they are recognized for being a very human-centric company. Mm. So, so, you know, some reflection to, to think about in terms of size of the team and numbers, etc. Yeah, some of the anthropological yeah. aspects of the way people... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Maria and Carlos kind of really have a similar question here around... You'd, you used the word proximity, the proximity earlier. Um, and, you know, if we're geographically spread out, we're not physically together any, uh, as we used to be, maybe. Um, and, and the technology, you know, you can switch off the camera. You can stay silent. You can physically put the mute button on. Um, I guess, I guess, really, the question is, you know, it, how do we counteract some of the barriers? I guess that some technologies is, is yeah. both a, 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 a opportunity and yeah. a barrier sometimes. Which we'll say. Again, very good question and very practical, right? With very practical implications. Um, so, first of all, first of all. I understand that you cannot have that proximity all the time when you are geographically dispersed, and this is the world in which we live in, right? Um, that's where the leader needs to make an effort even more to make sure that this interaction, even more spontaneous, semi-spontaneous interaction are happening, right? Um, be careful in picking up signals when people disengage. But also make sure that you can equalize the field. Not everyone loves to talk for one hour like I do, right? So how do you make sure to bring all the voices to the table when you are in a, in a dispersed setup, for instance? You know, be careful with the, with the tools you use in order to collect ideas and to give space to everyone. Mm. And if someone doesn't feel like having their camera one day, it's totally okay. And that's why I think it's more important that you are able to, you know, to get the, to take the temperature of the team, right? Is that a sign that today I'm just having a bad hair day? Or is that a sign that I don't want to engage because I'm afraid? Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, um, uh, and, and the, a lack of other questions in the in the chat, but you know, let's keep them going. This 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 is a great connection we've made here, and um, thank you very much, Dominica. One of the, the words that kept coming out as you were talking, I'm not sure you used the word, but courage. We need courage almost sometimes to break that that yeah. invisible bubble uh, that around us and, and bring out psychological safety. It always takes it needs someone to change the pattern, doesn't it? To do Rob, absolutely, absolutely. Courage is, is very much a key word when you talk about psychological safety, and it's a key word for leaders. Um, I want to connect the word courage, especially with the, the bottom right dimension, mm. the one that was called open conversations. Yes. Mm? Open conversation is very much about having the courage to put the cat on the table. Aiming the courage to address difficult topics, hmm. right? And trust me, we all would prefer to be talking only about nice things with our team members and with each other. Yeah. I mean, who would prefer, who wakes up in the morning and thinks, I hope I'm going to have some very difficult conversation today. I, let's hope that my boss is coming to me and giving me a very constructive feedback. Hmm. Or I'm going to give my team member a very constructive feedback. No one, literally no one wakes up with that 
desire in the morning. But we need to accept that this is needed for each of us to grow. It's a prerequisite, right? Mm -hmm. So do you choose the easy way that doesn't have any impact? Or do you choose the hard way with a lot of courage? It's going to be difficult. It's going to be painful. But will have an impact on your team, on your team members, on the company, on yourself as a leader. It's our choice and our responsibility as a leader. Absolutely. And, and you know, on the, on the topic of courage, if any of you has time and is interested, I would recommend very much the book from Brené Brown. It's called Dare to Lead. It's a book that has changed completely my own approach to leadership. And I can tell you, it has been painful. Lots of sleepless nights, lots of painful discussions, lots of difficult discussions. But, you know, the results, the impact on the team, the impact on how you grow as a team together, it's off the chart compared to the, to the price you have to pay for that. At the end of the day, it's our choice. Do we want to commit to this or not? Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Dominico. And, and let's just remember again, we also need the courage to sometimes try pineapple on our pizza. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so, ever so much, everyone. Thanks. This is the, the last uh, talk today on our virtual track. We've ended on a really good note. Thank you for all of your inspiring, uh, inspiring thank work. You. Thank you, everyone. Uh, don't forget, there is a, another talk on the main track. Please stay online. Click on the main track icon on the left there. And we've got our keynote speaker, uh, a final keynote speaker today, Cliff Hazel talking about going beyond cut and paste agile. We'll see you there in 10 minutes. Dominico, thank you. And everyone else, thank you very much. See you Bye. soon. Bye-bye.